Okay, so this chart is uh, very straightforward. It's the camera look quick guide. So if you're if you're going on set and you just like you know you want something, these are some really conventional things that are I'll just describe how to do them. Um, they're very easy, and uh, in theory, once you once you you got a little bit more experience, you'll just intuitively know these as a director or a director of photography. But I thought it'd be nice just to have them all in one sheet, just so we can see them. Um, Start off with shallow depth of focus, or depth of field, not depth of focus, although that's true too, I guess. Uh, shallow depth of field, uh, when your subject's in focus and then there's blurry stuff behind you, or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, how do you do that? Well, you need a, uh, a wide open aperture. Um... So you're gonna you're gonna if if your lens goes to f2, you're gonna open up to f2. If your lens goes to f1.4, you open up to f1.4. Um, it's harder to get shallow depth of field above about 2.8. Um, so like f5.6, for instance, it's kind of hard to get shallow depth of field. So you kind of need a lens capable of like f2.8 or f2, uh, which is very big, very big aperture. Um, you also want the subject close to camera. Um, this will help isolate them from the background, but it'll also, um, just through the physics, physics of the lens, um, it's, it's just, it's just an aspect of the physics of the lens. If you, if you try to do shallow depth of field and have them really far away from camera, closer to where your lens would be at infinity, everything is going to be in focus at that plane because they, they're so far back that they're basically part of the background at that point. So you want them close. Um, you typically want a long lens. Uh, and this is different depending on what kind of camera you're using, but um, most consumer cameras, 50 millimeters is pretty good. Um, uh, 100 or 200 uh, will will definitely help with the shallow depth of field. Um, a lot of portraits are taken between 85 and 200 for that reason. Really, really shallow depth of field that way. Um, you are going to also need to figure out how to uh, darken the scene. And this is sort of a, a physical a physical consequence. When you're when you have a really wide open aperture, you're getting a lot of light. You probably need to find a way to cut down that light. Um, the easiest way to do that is to drop the ISO of the camera. But if you're not doing that for some reason, maybe it has a native ISO you want to stay at. Um, you don't want to close down the aperture and make it darker. So you probably need to put uh, neutral density, uh, which is sunglasses, on the front of the lens. Um, the other way is to mess with shutter speed. But again, if you're making a movie. You kind of want to keep the shutter speed the same, uh, just to keep it internally consistent, for for reasons. Um, so you're probably going to want to do neutral density, which is the glasses that you put on the front usually. Uh, deep depth of field. So the opposite. Uh, everything is in focus basically. Well, you're going to want to close down the aperture. And this is where. Any lens can basically achieve deep depth of field depending on how you do it. Um, because a really fast like f2 lens, you can close down to f8 or f16 or you know whatever. Um, it'll do that. So uh, you you just close down the aperture of whatever lens you have. You really don't need a fancy expensive lens to get deep depth of field. Camcorders basically have deep depth of field because they they. I don't really want to get into it now that I think about it, but basically because of the size of the sensor. They're just not capable of shallow depth of field, really. Even when you zoom in, everything is in focus. Um, you, it's a help you along for deep depth of field. You could be far from the camera. Um, as I was explaining earlier, you know, you if you get the subject basically where the infinity mark is on your lens, uh, in focus, everything behind them is going to be in focus too. So, it's I think it's called the critical focus range or I don't know there's some weird term for it but basically if you look at the lens and it says infinity or it's close to infinity and your your person is past that foot mark like 10 feet or 12 feet or 50 feet or whatever you're you're probably got them in focus um it also uh wide lenses are known for deep depth of field um so you don't need a 50 or 100 you could do 50 or 100 um it would I don't know that there'd be any consequence for doing that, but wide lenses more or less can only do deep depth of field. Um, and it's another physical property. Uh, that's just how they're made. And 
a couple other adjustments that that exist in wide lenses. But if you but the stereotype is shallow depth of field, a 50 or like an 85 or 100 shallow deep depth of field, like a 24 or 17. Um, depending on your sensor size, a 24 actually might act like a 50, but uh, you know, eight millimeters is incredibly wide and basically everything is in focus on an eight millimeter lens. Um, and then, and then obviously you need to figure out a way to bring more light. Um, cause you're probably using a stopped down aperture like F8 or something. Um, so it's the opposite problem. You have a shallow depth of field, deep depth of field. You need to control the light somehow. Um, again, it's usually dropping down the ISO, uh, I mean, boost or it would be boosting up the ISO, but again, with with digital cameras, you don't want to boost them too high because they they get what's called a, a sensor noise, which makes it look grainy and messy. Um, so, other ways to do it: lights, obviously. That's probably the most efficient way to do it. Um, there's some camera tricks you can do. You can mess with the shutter speed once again. Um, if you have neutral density already on your lens, you can take the neutral density off, but big one is lights. You need to somehow add light to it. And lights are literally the way you add light most of the time uh, in some fashion. You know, obviously you can bounce light too, off of, like off of a white surface, but you need to add light. Um, all right. Uh, another good thing to just to do is to keep the camera eye level, unless you have some other reason why you wouldn't. Um, the way we experience the world, uh, when you're talking to a person, you're looking into their eyes and you're sort of way you see them is at your eye level, so you want to keep stuff uh, there. Um, you can really tell when it's not eye level because it's it like draws attention to the fact that it's not eye level. So if you want to make a subject look small or weak, uh, do an overhead light or overhead camera. Um, so it's above eye line. Um, when you're looking down on something, they are smaller than you. That's sort of the logic there. If you want to make something look big and powerful, uh, shoot below the eye line. If you watch any of the Avengers movies, Adventures, Avengers movies, um, much of their stuff is shot, especially when they're in a battle or where they're starting a battle, is shot below eye line, looking up at them because they're the hero. They're they're big. They're powerful. Um, it's just a trick. It's just an intuitive trick that camera operators have been using forever. Um. What else? Uh, oh, uh, beautiful faces. Uh, this is more of a photography thing than anything else because cinema, the the shot is beautiful. Um, there's not a whole lot of motivation to make the actors look beautiful, even though you do. That's why you have a makeup department, for instance. Um, but if you want beautiful faces, you need a long lens. Because lenses, as they get longer, they flatten out the faces. Um, so they all they put the face on one surface. So if you have a huge nose, on a long lens, that's going to be a regular size nose, for instance. That's my sort of issue. Um, again, depending on your camera, it's probably 50 millimeter plus. Um, 200 is is what you know high fashion is basically, or 85. Um, if you want distorted faces, well, that's easy. Um, everybody knows how to distort a face. You just put a fisheye lens on there, um, which makes sense. You know, a short lens. And I mean a short focal length. So eight millimeters is going to distort. Usually uh, 12 will distort on basically any camera. Depending on your sensor size, 24 is distorting. Um, if you're really hardcore about it, you can, also, you can also see distortion all the way up to 50. And after 50, everything pretty much flattens out. Um, so if you want crazy looking faces, slap on a fisheye lens and uh, that's what you get. And if you want it a little bit more subtle, pick something in the middle. Oh, uh, let's see here. Flat lighting. Okay, so flat lighting is just a good way to shoot video or or film, I guess, because um, it gives you it gives you a better chance of being able to see the person's eyes, and see details in their face, all that kind of thing. Um, the other kind kind of lighting is hard lighting, and um, hard lighting is just lights that you would put up that cast a pretty strong shadow. Flat lighting tries to do away with the shadow as much as possible and tries to evenly light everything. Hard lighting is what you experience in your daily life, especially if, if you're in the sun. Flat lighting is basically the opposite. Uh, it's the shade where everything's bouncing around, all the light's bouncing around, and, and it's diffuse and soft and even. Um, 
So flat lighting, uh, you're gonna want a big source. Uh, I don't know if this is a secret, but the sun is a very, 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 very small source. It just hits everything. Uh, so the sun is harsh lighting. A big source could be you're shooting sunlight through a big sheet and the sheet is glowing, I guess is how you would describe it. So you went from the sun, which is, you know, the width of your thumb at arm's length to a sheet, which could be 12 feet across. Now you have a 12 foot across light source. Very useful. Um, doesn't have to be a sheet. People use a lot of things called light domes, which I don't particularly use very often, but they exist. Um, you can also just bounce it off a ceiling, a wall, the concrete, whatever. That creates a big source because whatever it hits is now the source. So that's a good way to make a big source. Um, yeah, so sheets, ceiling, concrete is really great. It's concrete. Concrete's great because it has a little bit of brown in it. And when it bounces back, it's, I mean, brown is orange-ish. So it gives people skin tones a little bit better. Um, my ideal studio would have regular, like, unbleached concrete, uh, just because that's a really useful color. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Um, oh, and also, uh, the three planes of lighting slash action. Um, this this gives a more 3D look to your, to your image. So this is cinematography stuff. Uh, we got the foreground, the midground, and the background. Um, obviously, when you're lighting, you want to light the foreground and or where your subject is, the midground and or where your subject is, and the background will have a different color, intensity. I mean, there's, there's a million ways to do it. Action is the same thing. Um, following action in the foreground is very different from following action in the midground and the background. So it's good to uh, treat the image that you're, the frame that you're building with three planes that you want to work in. For instance, this is basically two planes. It's I guess the background is this, and then this is, I guess, the midground, if that makes sense. But there's definitely a 3D characteristic because my hand is moving, uh, and it's it's separated from that. That's sort of what you're trying to do is this 3D 3D illusion based on lighting and stuff. So if I really wanted to make my hands look really 3D, I'd probably put an accent light over here, put an accent light over here, so that way I can really separate my hands from the from the background. And it's nice to have a little bit of light poking on the hands. I don't have it right now. So, um, and so yeah, foreground, midground, background. Uh, it's good for blocking action. It's good. For, it's really good for lighting. Uh, you can do it again, lighting with intensity of lights, but also color of lights. A lot of movies, the background is a different color than the foreground, and that's on purpose. That is not an accident. Um, and then there's just other stuff that you should you should be aware of. Uh, I really like working on the rule of thirds. It's that grid that cuts everything into like that. That's your frame. I like putting people's eye lines on this line. I like putting uh, horizons uh, on either one of the two lines. I like putting people on one of these two lines. Um, it's just it's one of those intuitive things that your brain looks for patterns, and it's really nice to put it on a rule of thirds grid if it's an important piece of information. Um, again, I already talked about lighting slash color biases. Uh, a really common one is teal and orange. Teal for the dark, orange for the bright. If you've seen any Michael Bay movie, uh, skin tones are orange, everything else is teal. So, unless it's an explosion, which obviously is orange. Um, also, you just wanna be aware of the empty space in your frame. Uh, empty space does something to your brain. Um, it's really good at like loneliness or despair or frustration. Empty space is good for that. But again, if there's no empty space, the, you, you might be claustrophobic. You might be too intense. It might be uh, too fast moving, for instance. So there's a there's a push and pull. Just be aware that empty space does stuff to your frame. Um, and then just other like photography tricks. Um, we have leading lines, so, you know, like a staircase is a really great example. Um, shooting a gun and following the bullet, that's a leading line, that kind of thing. Uh, action movies are really good about um, using the leading line to fake you out. Like somebody will throw a knife, and then you'll just have the other actor holding a knife and just jerk their hand back at the last moment, so it looks like they're catching the knife. That's a leading line trick. Um, other ways to do it. Center framing, uh, if you ever saw the recent uh, 
shoot, I, from, from, I forget what it's called. It's uh, Charlie Theron and uh, the British guy, and they're in the Australian desert. Mad Max. Mad Max Fury Road. So Mad Max Fury Road, 90% of it is shot center-framed so that the action exists around the characters. So you got the character's head. Stuff is happening around them all the time, and even if, even if they're moving around, the camera is center-framed on them, which is really useful. Um, following motion for the same reason, that also goes back to the throwing the knives trick. Um, but yeah, it's sort of just intuitive stuff. So that's the guide. Again, just shallow depth of focus, just, you just want a wide aperture, long lens, deep depth, depth of focus, you want a wide lens, maybe close down the aperture and then figure out how to add light. Um, camera eye level just makes sense. Uh, if you want somebody to look weak, look down on them. If you want them to look powerful, look up on them. Uh, if you want beautiful faces, you want a long lens, and you might want to add shallow depth of focus to it, but you don't have to. If you want distorted faces, go faces, go with a fisheye. If you want flat lighting, you got to have a big source, and ceilings, floors, and uh, sheets are very helpful for that. Uh, three planes of lighting, there's foreground, midground, background. You're trying to build a 3D image in a 2D uh, universe. And, uh, you know, just, just goofy stuff. Rule of thirds, lighting biases, empty space, leading line, center framing, follow motion. Uh, yeah, feel free to pause that and write it down. I, I just, I find it useful. I've had this cheat sheet in my notebook forever. And uh, yeah, so um, from, a, from a shallow depth of field point of view, I'm moving away from that. It's not really my, not really my thing anymore. Um, I, there's, a, there's a time and place for shallow depth of field. But for me, it just feels like a uh, high, high, uh, high magazine, high fashion. Um, whereas the world is like the iPhone is like a 24 millimeter equivalent, um, which is very wide. I mean, it's basically a wide angle lens. Um, so I sort of experience the world more like that these days uh, with a little bit deeper of depth of field. Um, you know, when you're looking around, everything tends to be in focus has to do with the way your brain interprets stuff and the information and then, and just where stuff is distance wise from you. But most everything tends to be in focus. Um, I'm trying to think my lens. Yeah. My, most of my lenses in my lens kit, cause I have a 17, a 20, a 24, a couple of 28s, a 35, a 50 and like a 105. And I, when I started, I was always on the 105 or, or whatever the equivalent would have been with those lenses. Um, and then I went down to 50 cause I liked 50. Um, but because I have a crop sensor, 50 acts more like a 75 or an 85. Um, and now I'm down to, you know, I was at 28 for a while. I really liked 28 and now I'm down at like 24 or 17. I like it. It kind of gives you a bit of a fish eye. It's not eight by any means, but yeah. So, you know, here's the info, but just be aware that your style, your preferences, and the way you see it is going to evolve, and hopefully for the better. All right, bye.